Okay. Well, I guess we'll move ahead to the class then. Beginning the class on white magic, rule 13, we left off where we were talking about uh, quantum physics somewhat. And uh, he said this, um, one of the secrets not yet revealed, fortunately, is concerned with the question of uh, light. Oh, we, which is, that's not really not quantum physics, but it's uh, uh, something we're talking about kind of uh, along with quantum physics about the different shades of light, four different shades of light he talked. And uh, four, we were talking about the four ethers. And we were wondering, well, uh, he talks about the different colors of the four ethers. And he says, this will is a secret that uh, won't be revealed for some time to come. So I've, I've been thinking about these four ethers uh, and he says each ether has a different color. And I was thinking, well, I've uh, seen the ether before in connection with my own body, but that's only like uh, one color pretty much. So uh, where's these four colors come in? And I've been contemplating this and I finally figured it out. He actually gave us a tremendous hint as to where to find the four colors of the ethers. Okay, before I give you what I uh, come to me on this, anybody got any idea? Where would you look to find, to look at the four colors of the four ethers? Any Your idea? Eyes. Your eyes. Yeah. Third eye, I believe. Okay. In the aura? How about the aura? Possibly. He gave us a big hint last time that uh, uh, it finally dawned on me. He says the four ethers are concentrated in the four kingdoms. Uh, the, the fourth ether is, is uh, focused mainly in the mineral, the third in the plant, and the uh, second in the uh, animal and the first ether in the human kingdom. So then it occurred to me, well, that's how you see the four ethers. You look at the mineral, you look at the plant, and you look at the animal and you look at the human. And all of these have ethers around them that are visible. Now, uh, We've done experiments where we've shown uh, the group how to see the, the human ether, but if you look at a, uh, even a mineral or uh, any type of form, it, they all have an ether around it. Now, concerning the colors, that's something we've never went into. First of all, let's uh, look at our own etheric body one of the ways to do this is to either put your thumbs together or thumb and finger like this, hold it against a, 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 a background where you have a single color, like a white background works best, and put your thumb and finger together and like this, and then slowly pull them apart until they're about a quarter inch apart and look at the empty space right in between. And as you look at the empty space, you'll see your etheric body about a millimeter or so away from your physical body. Okay, you should see that if you're looking at that empty space. I see it loud and clear. Now, the next thing for you to look at, this is something we haven't done before, is to look at the shade of violet. And where you see the violet is on your actual skin. Okay, so look at the space in between. The next thing to see is the etheric body just extending about a millimeter. It's uh, in a kind of a, a little bit of a bluish hue, but then you'll see a violet right on your skin. Okay. Anybody see the violet? Well, I see the violet when I look in the cave of my Eisner Center. 
You're what? You're what? When I look in meditation in, in the cave inside the head, I see the violet light. Okay. Now, can everybody see me? You put your hand like this, put it together, pull it apart about this far, about a quarter inch. Look at the space in between. And you should be able to see the violet right on your skin. I can see it. You can see it, Melba? I can see it. I see it. Okay. Okay. No, what I, does I, it what what shade of what does it look like? It's a deep violet. It's not real light. And I see it on the top of my thumb. I don't and then I can see a lighter shade of it going across my index finger. Yeah. yeah. As I've got it as I'm holding that position. So I, I, I saw two shades of it. Okay. Good. Anybody else see the violet on your finger? Okay, practice that. Practice that this week and practice seeing the violet. And then also look at a plant, an animal, or an object and try to see the uh, uh, violet in that. I uh, haven't had a lot of time to work on this, but I concentrated on some physical objects and the uh, mineral kingdom definitely has a different shade of violet. It's not so much that one is a lot brighter than the other, it's, the, the, it, it's I would describe it as the density is different. The density in the mineral kingdom of the shade of violet there is, is uh, I, got a, uh, I got a question. Is not, not, not as um, brilliant as the, in, in the, in the human, so to speak. So it's kind of a, uh, a brilliance of the violet is is different there. Uh, yeah, Stacy. Stacy, do you have something to say? Stacy, uh, yeah, uh, I, I I was gonna ask. Uh, uh, does all the kingdoms uh, they definitely have a violent color to them or a violent tint? Must do. I know that. From what I've been looking at, they definitely do. And uh, I'm a little rusty on uh, this type of thing. I used to practice uh, this quite a bit and was getting pretty good at it, but uh, I can still see them pretty good. But uh, yeah, the shade of violet, is it's interesting to see. Now, if you look in the mirror also and look at the your aura around you or your etheric body, you can also see some uh, violet in your face. So uh, there's some violet connected with the human kingdom, and then there's violet connected with the three lower kingdoms. And each, each one of the kingdoms manifests uh, one of the ethers more than the others. So this is how we can see the different shades of violet. That's something the Tibetan never told us how how to do but he hinted at it in our last lesson which i found kind of uh, interesting now he says we see these different shades of violet and we thus construct the shadow now, this is something he he says he can't give us the details of this rule because it's too dangerous but evidently by seeing the four shades of violet and then using your imagination to uh, uh, in constructing your visualization out of these shades of violet can produce magical work of some type that he's not exactly clear, except it will speed up the physical manifestation of whatever we're trying to do. So this is a very interesting subject to uh, contemplate. Okay, so that's one of your assignment for this week is to j just focus on seeing your own violet and uh, also look at some plants. If you have a pet, look at your pet and look at, a, look at some mineral things, maybe a crystal or book or 
anything you got laying around and try to see, see the shades of violet. The easiest shade of violet to see will be in your own body. Okay, so practice that uh, little exercise I give you. Put your finger and thumb together, pull it apart till it's about a quarter inch. Look at the empty space. And as you're looking at the empty space, eventually the color of violet will appear on your skin. It, will be, it won't be in the empty space like the etheric body, but it will be on, on your actual skin, which is kind of uh, interesting. Okay, any comments or questions on that before we move on? Yeah, I, uh, every morning after breakfast, I stop at the convenience store before going back to the house, and uh, there's this young lady that's a cashier there, as soon as I walk in the door, she gets this big smile and her aura, but from above her shoulders and head gets like several shades brighter. And, and after a, a few weeks of seeing this, the idea pops in my head, well, I got to get this girl into a blue triad. Yeah. <laughs> but being Paris, Texas, she's probably raised Southern Baptist. So I'm going to have to figure out the words to get through to that barrier. And uh, one way I did it said, well, a lot of my friends say I'm kind of like a, a real life Merlin. She goes, oh, okay, I get that. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's interesting. If, if somebody's kind of expresses happiness or positive emotion, their aura grows in intensity and that's easy to see. Now, another one that's easy to see if somebody feels really negative, then they'll have a black cloud over them that's actually pretty easy to see also. <laughs> so uh, extreme negativity or extreme positivity increases the, uh, the, the, uh, this, the, the easiness of, of our viewing. Well, I seen somebody one time that I, I was used to seeing them and then I walked in the door and I looked at them and normally I mean, I don't actively see auras, but when I walked in the door and looked at this person, they had no aura. And that was no. a shock. Yeah, yeah. They probably had one, but it's just harder to see if they were kind of in a neutral zone there. Yeah. This person was pretty negative most of the time <laughs> anyway. We talked about the uh, quantum physics a little last time and uh, this relates very closely to what DKA is talking about in this rule, where uh, we're gonna talk about it a little bit more. And he talks about the principle of recognition in this rule about how this is a really important word. And uh, what's interesting is that quantum physics is uh, this double slit experiment is based on recognition. Let me uh, just let me just show you the how the experiment works. I have a graphic I'm going to show you. Okay, everybody, see that? Now, this uh, there's what they call an electron gun and they shoot a photon or electron through this double slit. And they don't know which one of these slits it's going to go through, but it goes through kind of like a bullet, OK? Now, when they look at this double slit to see which slit the electron or photon goes through, then it goes through like a particle and it lands here like a bullet. And then after they shoot a bunch of them through, it's like a whole bunch of little bullets have hit this screen. Now, if they don't look at this and they don't know which one of these slits it goes through, then it doesn't go through like a bullet, but it goes through like a wave. And instead of creating these, these little uh, puck marks there, it creates a wave, okay? So what makes it uh, um, act like a particle 
is not so much just looking because they can they look at both activities here but when they look to recognize which slit it actually went through that's that's the key that's what makes the difference when they look to see which slit the particle went through that changes it to become like a particle and the scientists no no one's come up with a really good explanation on this and like i say science or um, einstein was even baffled by it and so uh, uh, they still don't know for sure. Now they say, well, consciousness, it, uh, the particle is reading our mind. It's, but that's, that's really not what is happening so much because uh, it does the same thing every single time. I mean, it's, it always happens when you, when you check to see which one of these slits it went through. Uh, it always behaves like a particle. It never, it never, it doesn't like read your mind and then think I'm going to do it different this time. <laughs> you know, it always acts the same. So it's it's predictable what's going to happen. But what does happen is amazing. Now, <clears throat> I think this uh, this could be a key to creation because. The Tibetan says that uh, our physical world is an illusion. So, and if we take our mind off of our body, we can actually make our physical body disappear and turn into a wave, pretty much. So, if we're like this, if we look at this to see what's happening, then it's a particle. If we take our mind off of it, so we don't know what's happening there. It behaves like a wave and it's invisible as a particle. So DK tells us that the same thing happens in our physical world. And the fact that if we could take our mind off of our body, it would cease to act like a particle and become a wave and become invisible as a particle. So that's a pretty fascinating. So let's suppose that the whole universe is a creation like in a giant computer. Okay. Now, visualize it being like your computer. Now your computer, you turn your computer off. Everything in your computer is still there, even though it's off. Okay. You press the button and turn your computer on and then Viola, anything you want to look at is there. But it's only there when you're looking at it. It's only there when it's on and you're looking at it. You turn your computer off like this picture we got right here. When the computer's turned off, that picture still exists. All we got to do to bring up that picture is look at it, okay? So in the, <clears throat> let's suppose that, uh, this whole universe is a, a computer simulation. But to maintain, uh, to operate on the law of economy where you have, don't, you, you don't have to use as big a power supply, you arrange it so the stuff only comes up in the universe when the, when uh, it's activated by us looking at it, okay? <laughs> so if we're not looking at it, if we don't have our attention on the universe, it's just like a computer that's shut off. Everything is still there, but it's shut off. When we look at it, boom, it turns on, okay? So the well, universe doesn't have to, generate a tremendous power supply to present itself to you because you're not looking at it most of the time okay so as soon as you look at the moon well the the computer program manifests it to you okay uh, as soon as you look uh, at your tv set across the room or whatever your uh, the computer program manifests it to you as soon as you look at your spouse or your partner or your friend, 
the computer program manifests it to you, they're always there, but they're not there in the physical reality unless we put our attention on it. If our physical reality corresponds to what happens in this quantum experiment. And if that's the way the universe works, it's pretty amazing that um, uh, maybe there's some truth if a tree falls in the forest and no one's there to see it, it did it really <laughs> happen, <laughs> okay? It, it did happen in the computer program, but it only happens for us if we happen to look at it, okay? Because uh, uh, the DK talks a lot about the law of economy. So let's suppose the un whole universe is made on the law of economy. And so the creator of the universe says, why should I have all this power going into the program when no one is watching it? So the program's only on when we're watching it. So it takes the minimum amount of power to make everything in the universe work that way. So that's a, I find that a, a thought very uh, fascinating and that just something that occurred to me as we're studying this lesson. Okay, any comments or questions on that? I bet Rick finds that interesting. Does that mean, JJ, that when we're sleeping, if nobody's watching, we're not there because our mind has left? Uh, say that again. When we're sleeping, then our mind goes back to the soul. And oh, we, yeah. Does that mean we're not, nobody can see us really? Because, I mean, we're invisible because our mind is not here? Well, I know we're, some people look at us, their mind will be here, but. Yeah, I know when I'm sleeping and my body's pretty much invisible to my consciousness. <laughs> so that's an interesting thought also, yeah. This yeah. is JJ. It also begs the question, what, um, what different conscious entities in the universe are, um, you know, are, are looking at a given time, including the body of God in, itself, um, is, is the attention always on every part of the universe or um, because other higher entities may be viewing the manifestation, whereas our consciousness is not. So is it in manifestation or is it not? I mean, it begs a lot of strange yeah. questions. The, the teaching of the East is that um, God uh, breathed out the universe and he puts his attention on it. And when he decides to take his attention off the universe, the universe will disappear. So apparently he's got his attention on it right now. And because we're all parts of God, because we're putting our attention on everything, millions and trillions of lives throughout the universe are putting their attention on all kinds of things. There's nothing in the universe that doesn't have some conscious attention on it somewhere. Now, as an individual, we can only put our attention on so much, but as a co collected lives, uh, the, there's like even the drop of a sparrow, even the fall of a sparrow, according to Jesus, is seen by God, okay? because that is an actual life and the sparrow is aware that it's falling. So uh, that awareness is part of God's awareness, so to speak. So uh, the awareness of the one great life is everywhere. And, uh, but that won't last forever. Eventually the universe itself will end and will go into a state of universal rest. But as long as the universe exists, uh, there's lots of consciousness throughout the universe keeping the program on somewhere for everything, okay? So we look at the moon up in the sky, there's always some consciousness registering that the moon is, is there. But for you, you're not always looking at the moon, so, uh, uh, the the computer program that has created the moon doesn't uh, isn't 
on for you until you look at it. And then you just switch your part of the program on when you look up and see that uh, moon up in the sky. Okay. But it's always there in the program. That's what's interesting. And that's what makes this different from the other theories going around. The theory going around is that the universe doesn't exist unless you look at it. That theory is going around. Uh, that, that's always struck me as the wrong way. And now this kind of fills in a, a gap. The universe is there always, just like your computer program is in your computer. It always exists. But when you turn it on, you're able to see it, okay? And when the universe and everything in the universe, the people that you know, the objects you see, they're always there in the program. But they're there in a different way when you recognize them. Just like in quantum physics, the particle goes through one of the slits, but uh, it doesn't go through in your reality unless you recognize it. When you recognize it, then there's a particle that's, that's there. When you don't recognize it, then it's just a wave and it doesn't exist in physical reality, but it still exists. You know. Genji, so then we are all part of the same program since two of us can see the same thing. Like I'm right, right. We're all we're all in the same program. That's why we see the same thing. But we must be like our software would have to be operating on the same program, so two people can see the same moon. Like right, I, right. We're all in the same program. Just like if you look at my computer, you'll see the same thing that I see when I look at my computer. Okay, but uh, if you're not looking at it, you won't see it. <laughs> or if the computer's off and we won't see it but as soon as we turn it on we'll see the same thing and even when the computer's off the program is there and it's in existence but not in physical reality <laughs> thus this is the key to becoming a master and mastering physical reality is understanding this because you can take your attention if you're able to take your attention completely off your body, your body will disappear in physical reality, according to D DK. So that's pretty uh, fascinating. So instead of uh, increasing your vibration, you really still your vibration to uh, uh, make your body disappear. Because when your body disappears, then the real you is there. The real, the real you that's in the program is, is there. And, uh, it's, and you're always there. You're always on. You're the, the higher part of yourself is always on. The physical part of herself is like a computer, computer program that's turned off and on. And, uh, but the, the, and this is why the Tibetan says the physical body is not a principle, he says. But he says the higher parts of herself is a principle. It's, it's more real, is what he says. So when we look at these particles in the double slit experiment, these, uh, the physical electron is not as real as the wave. The wave function is always there operating and, uh, uh, and is able to manifest as a particle when our consciousness recognizes it. So it's a pretty fascinating uh, subject there. Okay, any comments or questions on that before we move on? He says, a white magician works with ethers of the lower kingdoms by utilizing the ethers from his own body, evidently using appropriate violet colors is the key to success. So in speaking of the, these ethers, he says, uh, we have all the ethers in our own body. And there's some way to utilize the different ethers in our creation. And like he says, remember, he just has, he says he just, this is kind of a dangerous one for people that do not have pure intent to uh, understand. So, uh, 
uh, he speaks around it. So uh, we have to use our intuition to be able to figure out uh, exactly how this rule works. He asks, is there some basic formula or proposition which must govern the magical activity? To this, he says, this uh, gives three keywords. Potencies produce precipitation. It says, in these three words lies the entire story. They sum up the history of the creator and the life story of the, and the environing conditions of every human being. Okay, potencies. Okay, you not only have to like visualize or put effort into things, you have, have to create a potency of effort. And do you ever notice uh, in life that there are certain things that maybe stimulate potency? Let's say, let's say a person, um, person's interested in health and he's, you know, tries to eat good food and tries to do this and that. But then all of a sudden, say he gets a terrible disease, and all of a sudden, the potency of his effort to produce good health becomes multiplied by maybe a uh, hundred. <laughs> all of a sudden, hey, man, I've, re I've really got to find out the, the key to, to, to restoring my health now, because this is serious. So all of a sudden, he has a potent uh, attention on this and you'll find many of these uh, health gurus had this happen in their life they were just ordinary people and then all of a sudden they were struck by some disease of some kind that threatened their life and then all of a sudden they focused a hundred percent on healing themselves and they made uh, interesting discoveries and then they were got so interested in it they become a guru and wrote books and different things but almost all these people that uh, write these health books had a tremendous crisis happen in their life and when a person has a crisis what it does it causes him to focus and this is the key to creation is is to 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 uh, uh, focus your will and I notice uh, uh, in business, uh, I spent a lot of my life calling on businesses and I kept asking myself, well, what, what's the difference between a successful business person and one that's not? Because I noticed that many people that are not very intelligent really succeed in business and other people that are very intelligent seem to uh, not do very good. And so I come up with what I call the Forrest Gump principle. Remember the story of Forrest Gump, how he, uh, he wasn't very smart, but when he set his mind to do something, he focused 100% and he was very successful at everything he attempted to do. Uh, even though he wasn't very smart. And I noticed this with business people, that some of the most successful business people were not very bright, and some of the ones that were very bright were not very successful. And th what I uh, honed it down to was focus. Uh, the ones that weren't very bright, maybe they just had one idea like Forrest Gump, and they went with that idea and didn't have anything interfere with their focus and they were very successful. But some of the very intelligent people, they got lots of ideas. And so they don't focus on one idea, they try to make a half a dozen materialize at one time and none of them materialize. And so it's a matter of focus. Uh, in some ways, the, the people that are, have lesser intelligence with fewer ideas have an advantage in the fact that they, their focus is less disturbed. So if you can be an intelligent person and still focus, then you're gonna have a more uh, ability still. So this, this uh, potencies of focus produces precipitation, potencies, potencies of feeling, uh, focus, fo uh, potencies of, uh, in, 
intensification of thought. Uh, this is this is an important key to making this rule work. He says the teachers of the race begin with the mind aspect of aspirants. They emphasize that which will govern the potencies. They deal with that which produces the objective form, which is qualified by them and is energized by them and which fulfills the purpose of the thinker. So all the stimulations we're uh, having today from books, uh, TV, internet is producing uh, thinkers and uh, thought is behind both black and white magic. Those things created in line with evolution that help humanity are those uh, uh, in the light, whereas the more selfish ones are in the dark. So this, this ability to focus is uh, a quality held by the, both the light and the dark. So uh, it's important that those who are in the light focus on uh, the positive things. Yeah, so uh, ha have you guys noticed uh, the principle of focus in uh, your lives or in other people's lives, how that, uh, that really seems to work? How about you, Curtis, when you were out selling to all those business people, did you notice that a number of them succeeded that weren't, didn't really seem that bright to you, but you, know, you almost wonder how they succeeded? Uh, Curtis, Curtis, had to bring a, Curtis had to bring his wife to a medical center. Uh, he put it on chat. Who's He's that? Here. Curtis had to take Sue Ann to a medical center for oh. some reason. Oh, okay. Uh, that's too bad. Hope everything's okay there. Okay. Um, yeah, focus uh, matters with everything in life, uh, whether it's business or love or understanding or friendship or whatever venture you go, whatever path you uh, take in life, you have to focus if you want uh, clarity and you want that uh, that to materialize. Focus is very important, very important. How about you? How about you, Ed? Have you noticed uh, uh, how focus uh, translates into success for people? Well, I certainly have, and I noticed that uh, in my own life, I'm interested in everything. And when I was in business, I wasn't as successful as I might have been. Yeah, you know that's a problem a lot of spiritual people have is. When we're in business, we kind of wish we could do more spiritual stuff, more meditation, more reading. That's been a problem in my life. I think I could have been a millionaire several times over if I wasn't interested in the spiritual side. <laughs> what do you think, Ed? you kind of feel that way too? I know that it says keep thine eye single, that it means keep your focus single. And in the mathematics, we know about vectors that when your energy is focus in a direction that's so where it goes yeah yeah what, what you put in your attention is where your life goes right right and uh the whole key is to be in the world but not of the world but the problem the spiritual people have for uh, uh taking care of business is you have to make a living in this world so you have to put often put a certain amount of attention on things that are just not very spiritual, just so you can bring in enough to pay the bills. And uh, this takes our attention off the spiritual work. And many of the, many of the uh, disciples of the world wish they could put 100% of their attention on the spiritual side. So DK says this is a problem and it's, the solution is really balance, is the disciple has to create the needed balance so that uh, his life is not lopsided, so he can put everything together and make everything work for himself. And uh, we all have that uh, problem to deal with. Okay, he says, um, there's another quat quaternary at play, he says. 
He says the quaternary is the thinker, the potency, the quality of that potency, and then the precipitation. So you have those four things involved in this rule. And this is one more uh, vocalization of the, the quaternary. And the potency is the difficult thing for us, especially as the disciple is trying to manifest something maybe that's a spiritual goal while he has to make a living, maybe selling real estate or, or being in retail or, or maybe being a carpenter or whatever, that uh, he's, he, this, this distracts from it somewhat. So he's got to keep that po spiritual potency up. But uh, each person needs to have a certain amount of time each day where he's undistracted so he can focus on the spiritual side. If you have to go make a living working eight hours a day, then when that eight hours is over or whatever, give yourself some time where you can focus on the spiritual side and your spiritual goals. Okay, the next uh, section he calls the precipitation of thought forms. And he asks the question, what exactly is a precipitation? Okay, it's a pretty uh, simple question. Anybody got to answer to that? Well, right now, if you're desiring your refrigerator, there's one floating through space sometime that's going to intersect. <laughs> <laughs> okay. He actually answers his own question there. He says, a precipitation is an Cond aggregate. What say? Condensation is the same. Yeah, yeah, that's a little bit the same. Yeah. It becomes more it's solidified and becomes form uh, through concentration. Uh, and, and it, when it reaches a certain point, it goes from being spirit to matter. And, and we're like 99.999% empty space. We are spirits. There's not very much here that is matter. So yeah, it, this is one of the things that B points out in this rule is uh, energy follows thought and thought is a lot more responsible for what manifests than just going and getting it at the grocery store or at the store or through Amazon or whatever, that uh, the thought precedes all precipitation. He says the precipitation is an aggregation of energies arranged in a certain form in order to express the idea of some creative thinker and qualified or characterized by the nature of his thought and held in that particular form as long as his thought remains dynamic, okay? So if you're going to create a business, for instance, that business, uh, w when you put enough attention and focus on it, the business materializes, becomes successful, and the business will remain as long as you put your thought upon it and keep your attention there take your attention off, everything will start to fall apart. <laughs> and uh, I was talking to a guy a while back who told me that uh, he had this uh, uh, mini mart store and it, he, he made really good money at it. And so he thought, well, I'll open up a second one. He opened up a second one, another town. Everything was the same except he hired a manager to manage it and he kept his original store going and it's continued to do really good. But the second store, which should have done just as good, just barely squeaked by. Didn't do, did about a third the volume. And that's because he, he, he figured it out. That's because that uh, he, he couldn't put attention on the second store. He, could all, he put all his attention on his first store. And so uh, he just gave up uh, expanding. So there are ways to expand, but uh, the, the person has to uh, make sure all the ducks are in order so 
the uh, uh, focus is creating the results that you want. But as you move outside of your ring pass knot, your, uh, uh, it's much harder to keep your attention on uh, 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 creations outside of your, uh, your thought process. But the people that do are able to expand uh, like this uh, are very balanced in their focus. So they can, uh, they can spread their focus in such a way that the original creation is, does not fall apart. With this interpretation, he says an ancient, he speaks of an ancient symbol which is interesting. This is kind of interesting. He gives us a definition of a precipitation. And this definition, he says, comes from an ancient symbol that he sees before him. And the symbol sounds pretty complicated for as simple a definition as he come up with. And here, here's his description. This definition comes from him looking at a blazing sun forms the background. And at the very center of that sun appears an eye, projecting downwards toward the right from this eye pours forth a stream of energy in the form of a beam of light. Its rays outward, widening towards the end into a second circle. And in that circle is a cross resembling what is called a Maltese cross. At the center of the cross is another eye, and with the, within the eye, the sacred word. Between the arms of the cross forming, therefore, is another cross, it is the swastika, and the arms emerging from behind the Maltese cross. At the bottom of the page whereon this symbol is found are four geometric forms. They are the cube, the five-pointed star, the six-pointed star, and the eight sided diamond superimposed one upon another. They constitute therefore the base of the symbol. And from looking at that, he translates all that <laughs> as a precipitation is an aggregate of energies arranged in a certain form in order to express the idea of the creative thinker. So, <laughs> so it's interesting how he, he got that, uh, uh, from looking at these complicated images. Now, if we could understand this image that he presented, we would understand how to manifest in almost a magical way that which we desire to create in the physical reality. So uh, there's probably a lot of hints in this, this uh, uh, imagery that he presents. He says the point, the line, and the circle, along with the triangle, have been exoterically applied to deity and the manifested universe. But these other forms, he says, will be accepted later on. So he says the, uh, we have the point, and the circle, and the triangle. They've all been images that uh, are very commonly taught by uh, many, many different teachers. But he talks about these other images that uh, we'll, we'll see later on. Does anyone know what the Maltese cross is? Okay, let me show you an image of one here. Okay. Can you see that? That's a Maltese cross. If you haven't, uh, don't have one in your mind. So this this is an important one. Uh, unfortunately, Hitler ruined the swastika for us because um, it's been a sacred uh, symbol for thousands of years and used by many esoteric people and used in white magic. But the uh, Hitler come along and used it for his Nazi program, and so now it's associated with evil, unfortunately. But what, what's interesting about the swastika is Hitler chose it going 
clockwise. And clockwise is symbolic of descent into matter. So the swastika that Hitler used was uh, a sign of him going deeper into materialism. Whereas the spiritual swastika goes, the arms go counterclockwise, meaning from matter into spirit. And that's more in use for the uh, uh, magical work of the soul, which is totally opposite direction of the Nazi swastika. But unfortunately, use a swastika going either direction, people will gasp and associate it with evil these days, which is unfortunate. It's like uh, it's, we're fortunate that Hitler didn't uh, put a lot of stress on uh, eating carrots or nobody would eat carrots today because they'd be associated with uh, with with evil. <laughs> you know? But the carrot itself isn't evil. But uh, we can associate anything with good or evil, but we need to look at things in such a way that uh, uh, at their essence, rather than what uh, applying guilt by association. Okay, uh, he talks about our solar logos and our solar logos places his thought in the four higher planes and manifestation naturally occurs in the three lowest. And we have to copy on our level what the solar logos and the higher lives do on their level. We have to apply the same principles of creation that the higher lives apply. And so um, that's what we'll talk about next week as we continue this is uh, applying in our lives what the higher lives apply in their own creative processes because the principles are the same no matter whether we be a human being or a master or a logos the principles of creation are basically the same okay anyone got any comments or questions before we sign off or i got a question uh jj uh did uh dj say uh that he laid one image, uh, if you laid one image on another image on the other image, that it would create a symbol that would uh, mean something? Is that what he's, is that what he's saying? Uh, he talks about that quite often about, in the records of the masters, they have uh, Im or images that are overlaid and you gotta look at the overlay to get the complete picture in your mind. Uh, so he talks about that overlay principle quite often and and doing astrological charts for the soul they use overlays also so that they can see uh, with greater accuracy how to interpret uh, various charts which he says what astrologers are working with now is quite primitive and and uh, there will be a, a new, more scientific astrology developed in the future. But, uh, yeah, he mentioned uh, astrology. Yeah. yeah. So he says, uh, okay, any, any other comments or questions? Yeah, you were, you were talking about uh, uh, sustaining uh, like a second business or whatever it will last. You know, through my adult life, I've been organizing communities, and I find one way that I uh, enable my my power to sustain more than one little organization is that in every one organization that I, I that I've uh, found, uh, I act in the beginning as a sort of cheerleader, and I give everybody this this uh, sense of belonging. We're family here. We're all friends, and we are we are a good thing, and all this. And before you know it, I've got people quoting and all that the things that I've told, and 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 they're being their own uh, pep squad, and that makes them sustain. I don't have to sustain more than you know a few people, 
and then they keep it going. Right. You have to duplicate yourself. And that's what this manager was unable to do, or this owner of this business I was talking about was unable to do. He couldn't, he didn't find a manager that could duplicate his, his uh, thought and uh, attention. So if you, uh, if you can project your uh, idea into the minds of other people so that they see it the way you see it, then you can expand beyond your, just your personal circle, which is uh, important. It's very difficult to do, and those who do do it, I uh, certainly admire them. Okay. Uh, uh, trying to put it, uh, your vision into somebody else's mind pretty rough to do and you can't do it by words you have to do it by basically telepathy you know get them to envision what you envision and right the and the, vi the vision the, the vision has to be extremely workable and understandable and that's uh that's part of that's part of the problem so that when the person sees it he says aha he gets that aha moment i see i see what you're trying to do you know and then he sees it the way you do. And then you, you can have somebody else with potential focus. Uh, you don't have to inspire an entire group. If you get one or two people and you give them the bug, uh, that's all it takes. They, they take over your, 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 your uh, focus and they sustain the group. Right. And so like Kennedy, when he made the goal to go to the moon before the end of the decade, I mean, he, he, put, he, he put it in such a way that uh, a lot of people saw it the way he did and wanted to accomplish it. And so he extended his uh, creative ability. Other people have said, well, other people have talked about going back to the moon or Mars and haven't made it happen because they just didn't have the uh, uh, ability to project the way Kennedy did. But uh, uh, so that's, a, that's an important thing to consider. Okay, anything else? Well, we will continue this next week, oh, and what, it's it's kind of thing, yeah. One other thing, um, I want to thank you, uh, my, for me, and and behalf of everybody else for you taking all you taking your time every Sunday to get us together to uh, bring us together as a oneness group and to ground us. Uh, uh, you, you go above and beyond uh, normal duties, and uh, I think we're all thankful for that. Yeah, and we don't give you well, enough uh, notice. Well, thank you. Thank you, Stacy. That's very uh, thoughtful of you. Okay, any other comments or questions? Well, I appreciate you guys all being here and uh, your support and your contribution and your desire to learn and precipitate good things. Let's go precipitate something great this week. Thank you. <laughs>